you need is one, click once love story. Uh, this is basically kind of a case study on uh, using click once in a phishing scenario in order to gain access uh, completely externally to a client of ours. Um, and it's particularly interesting because click once itself is not uh, really well known. How many people here actually know what click once is? One person who's installed Google Chrome before. Yeah? They also they utilize Click Once to actually install that. So my name is Ryan Gander. Uh, I'm a senior security consultant with a firm called NetSpy. Um, I pen test, I'm the phishing service lead, also all things computers. It's kind of my hobby, it's what I like to do. So what are we gonna learn in this uh, in this presentation here? We're gonna learn what exactly ClickOnce is, what are the internals, how does it work, uh, what makes it run, and what makes it uh, uh, good for phishing. Some of the uh, features of ClickOnce are actually extremely useful in terms of external phishing. Uh, we're gonna kind of walk through how to actually create a ClickOnce application. It's extremely simple, I think there's five lines of code, not very hard. Uh, we're gonna go through the phishing server setup. Uh, there's a couple of things, a couple of pitfalls that we have. Um, and then go through hopefully a live demo that goes off without a hitch. Sacrificed an intern this morning, so praise be. And uh, then we're going to talk through some of the prevention methods that you can use to actually stop click ones uh, from the outside. So click once. What is it? It's an executable wrapper that sits around uh, basically any sort of code that you want to run on a uh, on somebody's box. Um, system admins generally use this to uh, deploy applications throughout their uh, internal network into whoever needs it. It's installed on a per user basis in their uh, local app data directory and you don't need um, admin privileges as a user to actually install it. And that's particularly why it's interesting to uh, application developers or people who need to actually push these applications to people's computers. And it also supports multiple deployment methods. So you can install this from the web, local machine, uh, from a network share, basically anywhere you can typically run an EXE. Slide is a little wordy, but there's some main uh, pieces within Click Once uh, that are important. The first one is the dot application file. That's basically recognized by Windows as a dot EXE. It recognizes the dot application as I need to run a Click Once install right now. Um, so that's actually how you launch it. If you're going to install it, you need to launch the uh, .application file. And it also contains the location of the manifest files and the application versions and everything like that. Uh, the config.deploy contains the application settings specific to that version. So if you have to, say, uh, update the application, this is where those connection strings are going to be stored uh, and any supported run times as well. Uh, then you've got the exe.deploy. That is the potentially malicious executable uh, that you're going to go ahead and install on the user's uh, system. And then the manifest file. Um, that contains the .NET versions that are supported, uh, the permission levels that are requested by click once, and the signatures for all the other files. And it also contains the file name for the uh, executable itself. <coughs> so click once certificate signing. Uh, it's a Microsoft uh, product and technology, so it uses authentic code, basically to verify who published it. Um, you can go ahead and acquire your own cert, uh, code signing cert uh, from ACA, uh, Certificate Authority, or you can go find one on somebody else's web server if you want. Uh, there's some different signing stages that are available to click once. Uh, sign using a, a Certificate Authority. You can self-sign it by making your own local cert or unsigned. There's actually no cert uh, in that one, obviously. The last two, self-signed and unsigned, are actually treated the same in terms of uh, what ClickOnce sees. So uh, if it sees a self-signed cert and unsigned, it's gonna follow the same kind of flow um, for launching that application. Uh, ClickOnce is based off of a trust architecture. Um, based on the different execution source zones. So if you try to install a ClickOnce application from your local drive, it's gonna be a little different from if you try to install it from the external web. Um, it allows uh, applications to elevate privileges 
uh, automatically if it needs it. That's using the um, Internet Explorer trusted sites. Or it will prompt the user, and that's the important part. If it needs more permissions than what it uh, currently has, it will ask the user to go ahead and give it to them. Uh, the prompting levels are controlled uh, by that registry key there. Here's a couple of quotes uh, from Microsoft that I found relatively interesting uh, concerning ClickOnce. This top one is uh, by far my favorite. The, the most important use, uh, feature when it comes to security is, in terms of ClickOnce, that the end user can elevate permi uh, permissions without the help of an admin. Just think about that. It, it, it makes a great tool for phishing because the end user is the one that's responsible for elevating privileges. If the permissions don't exceed policy permissions, the application will download and install without asking the user any questions. And then if it needs more permissions uh, than is granted by the policy, the user is asked whether or not they want to trust this application. Okay. So uh, here is the original zone configuration when ClickBonds was actually being designed when it was in beta. I believe that was .NET 2.0 when it was being uh, uh, developed. And you can see here in the internet side, um, if it comes from the internet, the prompt for users to actually trust it and to elevate privileges uh, was enabled only for signed applications. And that's signed by a certificate authority. So it was looking promising at first. But once ClickOnce actually made it to uh, production, uh, they went ahead and changed that to uh, it doesn't need to be signed by a CA for any of the applications that are coming from the internet. Meaning that once again, the end user is the one responsible for elevating those privileges. So why did I actually use the ClickOnce application? So it's supported on all modern Windows uh, operating systems because it relies on .NET. And as you guys know, .NET, it has some backwards compatibility within its major versions. So if you have 4.5 installed on your box, if you develop ClickOnce with 4.0, it will still run on that machine. It's extremely simple to write. I touched on that earlier. There's only a couple lines of code that you actually need to write for this. Uh, and it's in C-sharp, which I find is not too difficult. Um, and then the major thing is that public browser exploits, in terms of phishing, um, they're highly version specific. And more often than not, they actually crash the victim's browsers. The reason they do this is because they actually crash the browser, the crash manager comes into play, and that's usually where they break out and run their own code. So, in terms of phishing, in terms of the red team uh, engagement that I had going on, I wanted to make sure that uh, the least amount of users were aware that they actually got phished. And if people see their browsers crashing, things like that, they're more likely, I would say, uh, to report that to IT. So it was also, obviously, it's a Windows technology or a Microsoft technology. Um, so it was made to be deployed using uh, IE. Uh, it's supported by IE 6.0 and up. Firefox and Chrome can support it, but it requires third-party add-ons, so you can't really rely on that. So from a phishing standpoint, what you need to do is funnel your users into using IE. Um, that's a simple check on the uh, web server side to see what the HTTP headers are. Um, it minimizes user interaction. Once again, this is one click, and that is all it takes to run that uh, um, malicious executable. And it can uh, deliver malicious code through multiple different options. It's a .NET project. You can write your own if you want. You are running code on their box, so you can write your own shell code. You can you know, write PowerShell if you want. You can include malicious executables and run it that way. So there's a bunch of different options that you can actually uh, perform there. Um, so in terms of payloads that you can include, once again, you can roll your own. That's, you know, write your own shell code. Um, that's originally what I was going for. Ended up getting flagged by uh, antivirus when I was testing it. Once again, this is a red team engagement. I want to make sure that um, AV doesn't uh, catch on to the actual malicious uh, executables that were, or uh, payloads that were being ran. Uh, Another is the standard Metasploit payload. I don't know how many people are familiar with the uh, Metasploit framework. Um, but you can generate your own uh, executables, your own payloads uh, using their system. And 
for some reason, uh, I'm not entirely sure why, the reverse HTTPS uh, shells were returning, but they were broken, so they didn't have all the functionality that they needed. Um, and so it's possible that AV was partially flagging uh, when it was pulling down its second stage of the payload. So I uh, ended up uh, abandoning using that. Uh, now, Justin at SixDub did a great follow-up um, on the blog that I wrote about this. Uh, on using PowerShell instead of a, an executable that you would include. Um, there's obviously some pros to that. PowerShell runs in memory and it avoids AV. AV, I have yet to be stopped by AV when I'm running uh, PowerShell payloads on a box. Uh, the difficulties with that is that changing out your payloads, if you're gonna uh, do some sort of dynamic generation of that, is a little more difficult and a little more tricky. And ClickOnce itself is already an on-disk technology, so I, you can kind of say that uh, um, having an on-disk technology is, uh, you already have that presence on the disk. You want to stay off disk as much as possible uh, when it comes to being flagged by AV, um, but ClickOnce is already there. So it's kind of a, you know, whichever way you want to go with it. Um, so that brings us to Veil Evasion. Uh, Veil Evasion is part of the Veil framework, uh, developed by some very smart guys. Um, and so I came across that and decided that the pros outweighed the cons in this uh, case. Uh, the pros is that the payloads are written in uh, different languages. You've got you know, Java payloads, Python payloads, um, basically any kind of uh, language that you'd like. And it also encrypts its payloads. So what it does is it encrypts the payload itself with a one character uh, password and then brute forces its own password and uh, basically decrypts it and then runs it. This helps it to be uh, to avoid AV because it's an encrypted binary. It can't actually see into the actual payload itself. Uh, the cons with this, when I was originally uh, performing this, was that there was a static random callback um, for my shells and that had to do with uh, Metasploit and how it, how it uh, handles the actual stagers itself. So every time a uh, meterpreter shell would come back, it's supposed to dynamically generate a new unique identifier. And what I found is that uh, it would generate one uh, unique identifier and continue to send that same identifier when it's trying to open shells on multiple boxes. And so, this was actually fixed uh, with a release of Stageless Meterpreter, I believe back in September, um, in the Metasploit framework. So I decided to go with Veil. Uh, so the problem, once again, was those, those static callbacks. If I tried to run this on more than one machine, I would only get one shell first, and then it'd sit there and wait, because it'd see the same UID. It'd say, no, I already have the shell open. I don't need another one. So the problem is that the solution was to dynamically generate uh, the actual payloads on a uh, per user basis. So every time a new user would visit the site, I generate a brand new veil payload specific to that user. Um, so how to create a ClickOnce application? I'm actually going to go ahead and skip through this. It's a lot of words, a lot of pictures. I'm actually going to go through it in the demo itself. and move on to the actual server setup it's, uh, itself there. Uh, so the web server that I, I'm using for this is uh, Kali 2.0. That's a penetration testing operating system. Uh, and on there I have Veil, Metasploit, and Apache. Um, I used Apache because of the mod rewrite functionality, honestly. So we could take a, uh, a request for this uh, getevil.com with a UID there and switch that into a subdirectory and launch their ID-specific .application file for that user. Um, and the great thing about this is, once again, this is a phishing test, this is a, a red team kind of thing. It's all about data. It's all about you know all being able to correlate uh, and say, yes, this person did these things. They, they clicked on the link. They, they launched the application. We got the shell back. Having those metrics is extremely helpful when you're uh, presenting this to the clients. Um, and so for this, I use just a standard Metasploit listener. Um, you can write your own uh, command and control if you want. Plenty of people have done it. 
this was a limited uh, window of engagement and frankly didn't have to have the time to write my own kind of uh, command and control infrastructure and handle those listeners, payloads, things like that. Um, and then uh, just put that onto a, an HTTP port, uh, port 80, and just had to connect back that way. Mainly because we're, we're targeting users during this, and those users are basically, they're gonna be checking their email more than likely on their workstations, not on a server itself. So they're more than likely to have outbound HTTP access in some way, shape, or form. So some of the pitfalls that uh, were, were ran into there, um, outdated packages and dependencies. Originally when I was uh, performing this, the operating system I was using was Backtrack 5. Uh, that gives you a sense of how uh, long ago this happened. But Veil does not play nicely with that at all. Um, and so when you install Veil, it installs Wine and you have to install uh, Python uh, Py to exe and some other Windows programs to actually compile that exe. And that was by far the longest um, part of building this, uh, this phishing click once, is getting all of those things to work properly. Now with uh, Kali and Kali 2.0, Veil is extremely simple. Uh, it installs very quickly, and you don't have to worry about those outdated packages at all. And then there's some signing restrictions. So once again, that comes back to uh, signing your, your code. Since we're dynamically generating a new payload per user and replacing that within the um, ClickOnce application, if you try to do that without updating a, uh, a certificate, it's going to break. Mainly because of uh, the .manifest file that has the signatures of all the different files. Um, but there's no easy way to, to re-dynamically sign your application within Linux. So generally you would use Mage or Mage uh, GUI, I believe it's called, within the .NET framework to re-sign your applications on the fly. That doesn't really go so well on Linux itself. Um, and so once again, the self-signed certs are only marginally better. It treats it the same uh, on the workflow, and so there's no real point on trying to uh, sign it with our own uh, certificate. And then cleanup, once again, uh, it's going to be installed on a per user basis into their local app data folder and then go into some machine specific subdirectories there. And so if you wanted to clean this up uh, on a per click once uh, basis, all you'd have to do is uh, go into that kind of folder and then find the app folder. It's going to be uh, your project name in, uh, in Visual Studio and just delete that folder itself. Or there's a couple other ways you can do it as well. Um, there's the add and remove programs <coughs> feature in Windows. You can delete it using that. Or you can uh, nuke everything. So by running the run dll32 with that command there, um, that will delete all of the online applications. Um, so you want to make sure you're not using any more uh, any other online applications before you use that, because that will blow those away as well. And then once again, it's on a per user basis. Uh, you don't need those elevated privileges of an admin to actually uh, remove this program at all. It's in your uh, local app demo. And now hopefully uh, the, win, uh, the demo will go well here. Uh, I'm using Windows 10 and uh, the Kali 2.0 server once again. Uh, first thing that I'll do is I'll kind of walk through very quickly the uh, project itself in Visual Studio. So as you can see here, uh, this is the code, or maybe you can't see that. Um, got a light in there. Okay. So there's only a couple of lines here. Uh, once again, five lines. You basically, you start a process within .NET, and then you attach a, a executable in this case, to that process, and then start. It's as simple as that. Um, on the right-hand side here in your solution uh, explorer, uh, the way to include the actual exe, you click and drag your exe on top of your solution. It includes it within the project itself, includes it within the manifest. Um, so in that case, it's, it's extremely simple. And then there's a couple of A 
couple of pieces to, uh, to change as well. So the first, once again, is the target framework. Um, so in this case, I'm just targeting the .NET Framework 4. Uh, what that allows me to do is to target uh, Windows 8, Windows 8.1, and Windows 10, all with the same uh, click once application itself. If you want to target, uh, target things like uh, Windows 7 or below, you're going to need to go down to the uh, uh, .NET Framework 3.5. And that's just, uh, if you want to do that on the fly as well, you can have both uh, templates basically on your web server and then uh, take a look at what web browser they're using to actually connect, which version of IE, and then decide which uh, template to go with. If they're running uh, a lower version of IE, more than likely they're using Windows 7, and you can use .NET Framework 3.5. So you want to make sure that that is the um, correct uh, framework for what you're trying to target. Come down here into the security side of things. This is the uh, spot that you specify whether or not it's a full trust application. If it's a full trust application and it's coming once again from that execution zone of the internet, it's going to go ahead and prompt the user whether or not they want to grant those full trust privileges to the application. So this is where you can do that. You can also make it a partial trust application, which uh, if it conforms once again with the uh, um, execution zone, uh, then it won't prompt the user for um, their permission to run because it's already within that context. And then the last little bit here is the application files here. So this has to do with the manifest file. So as you can see, the uh, top one there, the clickonesinc.exe, uh, that's that malicious file that we're including. Since we're dynamically generating that, we have to uh, make sure to exclude the hash. The reason you do that is because if you uh, generate your click once and then replace the exe with a new one, uh, it will recognize the hash as being incorrect and will not run the click once application. A good note on this is that if you do intend on signing your applications, you need to make sure all of your hashes are included. So if you want to sign with the CAA, you have to include uh, the hashes for all the different files. And then from there, it's as simple as uh, you know, hitting the publish button and uh, generating the files. From there, you want to go ahead and move them over to your web server, which I'll pull up here. So here is my Kali 2.0 box. Um, at the top here, I don't know if you guys can actually see it. I think it's a little cut off over here. It is the um, interpreter um, job that's waiting for a new interpreter payload to come on in. And from here, go ahead and launch up our Internet Explorer. Now, as you can see, I'm going to uh, just hack.me and go into the login page with a specific UID. That one is uh, AppSec itself. It takes a couple seconds here because once again it's dynamically generating those payloads per that uh, UID that's being supplied. And we see that, hey, you now have a login page. That's great. Down here it also tells you what to expect when you're seeing this. That helps the users who, oh, they didn't expect to see a pop-up now we're telling them, we're like, all right, yeah, we can access this survey. We need to go ahead and click run on this, on this pop-up that's coming up here. So you hit login, and uh, we see that the password was invalid. That's another um, just little thing that we were doing during this. If you tell them that their password was incorrect no matter what they entered the first time, more than likely they're going to try a different set of credentials, meaning that when you actually harvest the credentials out of this, you're going to get two sets of credentials per user. From here, you hit the login button, and let me pull this over. 
So this is the security prompt itself. This is saying this application is requesting the full trust on your box. Do you want to run it or not? Now as a user, I saw those instructions that said to run, so I want to go ahead and click run here. So if this was signed by a CA, would that prompt not happen? That prompt would, would not happen, correct. So uh, as you can see, Windows Smart Screen on uh, Windows 10 is telling me that this is an unknown publisher uh, right here. Um, and since it's an unknown publisher, it prompts you with that. There's no good way right now to get around uh, Windows uh, Smart Screen unless you sign your application once again. So if you sign your application, Smart Screen uh, will not uh, pop up. So I'm going to try to hit the Run Anyways button. That's a little off the screen here. And this is if you sign it by a server with a CA, not a self sign -in. Correct, yes. So if you, and I have a, a little flow chart here at the end as well um, that shows how it treats, come on. So, the uh, demo gods are not smiling on me today. Um, something with the uh, application itself. I wasn't able to hit the run anyways button on the smart screen, which was a little off the screen here. Um, but if you were to hit the, the run anyways button, it's going to go ahead and uh, run the application, launch that EXE, and then uh, return that interpreter shell uh, to your box. Uh, so going back here to the presentation. So what are some of the preventative measures that you can put in place? Uh, these are some of the ones that are already there. Uh, the first one is user education. That's always pushed the hardest, but we need to educate our users 100%. They need to know what's happening. There's an interesting uh, paper that was released by a Berkeley grad student uh, called Alice in Warning Lands. It basically took a look at Google and Firefox and how people interacted with the SSL warnings that you get in those and also how it, uh, people react to the uh, Google Chrome, this is a known phishing site or a known malware site pop-up. And that's the big, bold, red, scary one that you see. And it turns out that 30% of users actually click through the malware and um, phishing site warnings, 30%. And also over 70% of the users click through the invalid SSL certificate warning. Now, it's, it's possible that they weren't educated, that people, uh, they didn't have the training to say, hey, don't actually click through these things. But more than likely not, most corporations have some sort of training in place when you get hired or yearly um, that say, hey, these are bad, don't do this. So it's interesting that the metrics are still that high. So if we can't necessarily train the users effectively, what else can we do? Another one's endpoint protection, antivirus, having that on your box. It helps with, the, with known um, malicious executables. But once again, the uh, signatures for these files or for these payloads um, lag behind their actual usage. And that's just, that's just a part of uh, AV. Another part of AV though is uh, heuristics. But that requires a uh, practical balance in a corporate setting. So you can't have a pop-up for every single application or multiple pop-ups saying, hey, this application is trying to access you know, this file or this file. Because once again, the user is just going to be conditioned to just click yes, 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 I just let it do its thing. 
So you have to have that healthy balance. So finding that healthy balance with heuristics more than likely isn't going to stop an actual executable, a malicious one. And the last one is least privileged configurations. Uh, that's an important step as well, is if somebody does happen to get onto a box, if they do execute that, execute that malicious payload, they get onto a box, if they don't have the sysadmin or uh, local admin privileges or uh, anything like that, if they only have the least amount of privileges that that user has, it's at least harder for that uh, attacker to go ahead and elevate privileges locally and then continue to attack the network. So it can, uh, can discourage some attackers, but most of them, if you just take a couple hours and actually attack the system itself to try to escalate privileges, you're going to get those privileges. So at best, that just slows down an attacker. So those are all helpful, but they're not necessarily effective enough. So click one specific techniques for uh, preventing this. It has to do with the uh, code access security and the permission levels that the application has. So once again, when you saw in Visual Studio that it was a full trust application, you can, you can go ahead and modify how Windows responds to uh, that kind of uh, request based on its execution zone once again. So by default, uh, the full trust requires a prompt um, from the user. And you can disable that uh, trust prompt using uh, that registry key there. And once again, the prompt is controlled by the zone. So if it's coming from the internet, local machine, intranet, uh, things like that. So you can go ahead and this the registry settings affect whether or not the user is prompted itself. So if it's enabled, any applications unsigned can go ahead and come through and prompt the user to elevate the privileges to install the ClickOnce application. If you set it to authentic code required, it needs to be signed, once again, by a valid CA cert before the user will be prompted to accept that. And if you just disable it, if it doesn't conform to the policies uh, or that trust architecture that's already given to the different zones, then the user won't see a thing. They will never be prompted to actually elevate the privileges, and the ClickOnce application itself uh, won't be installed or ran. So that's the best way to prevent ClickOnce applications from coming from the internet. And that can, once again, be controlled by uh, group policy, so you can push that down through your corporation. And then uh, Windows uh, 8 and Windows 10 is where Smart Screen came in. So back in Windows 7, it was just it was simple. They hit the Run button, everything was good. But now with uh, the Smart Screen that's there, it's enabled by default. It's not recommended to disable that. Um, and the default OK action that comes up when you're actually connected to the internet is this Don't Run button over here. To actually get to the uh, prompt where you need to, where it will let you run the application. You need to go to a more info button, um, which will then enable the run anyways button, and then you need to click that. So that's an additional two clicks that you need for a user to actually run this application. And what I found is that when I'm targeting these kind of uh, operating systems themselves, is that if it's not signed by a certificate authority, and if users do see this, there's a significant drop in the amount of users who actually go through those steps. Once they see smart screen, they're like, okay, hold on. Do I really, really want to run this? And if they do, they once again need to click two more times. With click once, it's all about, and phishing, it's all about ease of access for the user and uh, convincing them that it is legitimate. So here is the uh, actual smart screen flow chart um, done by uh, Robin uh, Shodan down there. Um, and there's a URL. But as you can see, if you come in through the internet, if you are um, signed by a CA, you go ahead and hit the no uh, smart screen. And once again, if you come down this way, you need to have a signed executable as well before you hit the no uh, smart screen filter. Anything else, and you will hit that filter, meaning that more than likely, you're not gonna see the kind of results that you would if you were to have a signed application.
questions. Um, I'm finding it hard to see why anybody would deploy this without using uh, on sound executable. Um, is there a specific reason for that? Are they hard to get, or is it just a case of not power? It's it's a case um, of cost mainly, and once again, if you're dynamically generating the payloads, you can't dynamically sign the application within Linux. If you have this based off a of Windows box, you could write a script to use the mage.exe to dynamically sign it before you uh, push it off to the actual user itself. So in this case, uh, when I was doing it, I was on a Linux box, and so that kind of dynamic signing wasn't an option. And I didn't want to have to sit down and try to figure out, okay, get Wine working, get Mage working within Wine, try to, and it was just not, not worth the time. Once again, this was a very time box kind of thing, so time was very important. That was just what I was going to oh, Perfect. So, hey, did you have to make a payload? You said, I think you mentioned this, so you had to make a payload per user? Per user, in this case. So, in the case where you were setting up a unique ID per each payload, would you automate that, I guess, through a script as well? So, correct. So, when I'm sending out these phishing emails, each one, uh, I actually go ahead and hash uh, SHA1, hash their uh, email, and append that to a parameter, basically somewhere within a hyperlink. And so when they click on it, I can see that, okay, this UID uh, access the web server, and then I can correlate it back to uh, what it was hashed from. And so they are given those unique identifiers when I'm uh, sending out the emails themselves. And then that's tracked throughout their whole um, uh, website experience. So basically, I set a cookie with that value and then continue to pull it from there. Now, is this like payload post bail or payload like Visual Studio new, you know, click once.exe or is this like after bail, you know, like creates a new payload from that original one? So so what you do is you create your uh, click once application.net and you move basically a template over to your web server so that every time a new, um, new person visits the site, go ahead and pull the template into their UID specific directory and then replace the malicious executable with their newly generated. Okay. Yeah. Anyone else? I'm guessing this is like an IE specific. Yeah. It is. So restriction. Right, exactly. So uh, like I said, Mozilla, Firefox, and Chrome have the ability to uh, launch these properly, but you need a third party add-on. So you can't really trust that the users are going to have the installed. So if you try to browse to a dot application file in Chrome, it'll just download the file. It won't actually run the dot application. So and same with Firefox. So uh, it's e relatively easy to funnel users into IDE only. So if you check the headers and you see that they're not using IDE, you just display on a page saying, "I'm sorry to access the survey or whatever your phishing site is. You need to use IDE for the functionality." So. Can you share what kind of responses, like response levels, you got with this? Um, I can I can generalize it. Um, I've seen about usually about thirty percent of the users actually click the link, and out of those, uh, there was for at least one of the scenarios we had about forty percent of the people who clicked the link went ahead and ran the payload. So that's forty percent of the users that I now have shells on their boxes. And I can go ahead and you know, start, if I don't have admin privileges on their box, I can go ahead and start um, trying to ele elevate my privileges. Or if they already have admin, I can start attacking uh, other network resources and uh, try to gain network privileges. So. Cool. Well, thank you guys for coming. Appreciate it. You guys have a good rest of the